Boy, uh, my phone was buzzing like crazy this morning. We have so many of our people that are sick and in the hospital and have family members that are sick. It's like my phone was incessant. I bet I received a phone call from five to seven families today that said, pray for us, we're in the hospital. Pray for us, our family is sick. Pray for us, our family's going through an unbelievable trial. And so um, I want to pause for a second and just pray for those who are struggling with some of those things this morning. At the Burkholder House, we are. I'm, I'm sick today, so if I don't, I don't hug you this morning, it's not that I don't like you, it's not that I don't want to be with you, um, I do not want to infect you. As a matter of fact, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach and leave soon as I'm done today because I am an incessant hugger, you know that, and, um, and I don't want to get um, anyone sick. Please be in prayer for Amber. Amber's sick today, and, and uh, she, whenever she gets a chest infection, what it looks like she has, that's what I have. Uh, we're always afraid that it goes into her lungs, and, and she ends up being hospitalized half the time. And so uh, please keep Amber in your prayer, and let's pray for those who, for one reason or another, aren't able to be with us today. Would you bow your head and your heart and, and pray with me? Father, we love you. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you care for us. Thank you that you give us so much more, obviously, than we deserve, but so much more even than we need at times. And Lord, we're so grateful for your constant care in our lives. Thank you for the standing that we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you that we can stand with confidence that we can stand knowing who we are in Christ, not because of anything that we have done, but for what Jesus Christ has done for us. And Lord, our, our worship is based on our knowledge of you, and our worship is based upon our knowledge of what you have done and what you are doing in our lives. Lord, we pray for, for church members that are struggling today. Lord, I, I don't remember a Sunday, Lord, getting so many phone calls from so many people asking for prayer. And so, God, I pray for those that are sick today. I pray for church members that are in the hospital for one reason or another. I pray for church members that are alongside of family members that are dying of cancer in different situations. Lord, I just pray that you would minister to them today as only you can. And Lord, help us to hear from you this morning. Help us to realize as we look at Exodus 29 and other passages of Scripture, help us to understand who we are in Jesus Christ and the privilege that we have as your priests to enter into your presence and to minister on your behalf. Help us to grab a hold of that truth, understand it today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Several years ago, Mark, when Mark was still here, Mark and I joined a health club. We joined a UFIT health club. Um, UFIT had, uh, Mark was here at the office, and I was here at the office, and there's a UFIT just farther down on Taft, and we thought, boy, great father-son thing to do, and so we'd come to the office and work, and on the way home, he was actually living at his home with us at that time, it was before he and April were married, and so we thought, man, we'll, we'll just stop by the gym on the way home, and we'll, uh, you know, pump some iron. He always pumped a lot more than I did, but... Um, I used to like to stand beside all the weights that he would lift as if I was lifting that amount of weight right there. And so uh, uh, we did that for several years, and it was right on the way home, right on the way home for us. And then they opened up a U-Fit right by our house on, on Pines and Hiatus. And we thought, how cool is that? There's one on the way home that we can hit during the week, and then there's one by our house that we can hit on the weekend. And so uh, I'll never forget that first weekend. I walked in. I'm a member. I walked in, showed him my credential, and the person looked at me and said, you can't exercise here. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? I'm a member of UFIT. And she said, yeah, yeah, but your membership only allows you access 
to the one where you joined. And I said, well, what kind of membership do I need to, to be able to use this one and that one and whatever? She said, you have a standard membership. She said, you need a Lime card membership in order to be able to use any gym you want. And I'm like, okay, cool. How much is a Lime card membership? That's another $9.99 a month. All right, now I was only paying, I joined because it was so cheap. I joined because it was like $10 a month. And now they're telling me that, that, that to use that one and this one, it's gonna cost me another $10 a month. She said, I'm sorry, your membership doesn't qualify you to work here. You have a standard membership. To work at various locations, you need a Lime membership. Now, not, not, not. Now, follow me where I'm going. So, you see, I had access to the gym. I just didn't have complete access. I was a standard member, but I wasn't a Lime card member. Now, now, now follow me. By the way, I moved my membership over to the other one, and it worked out. I wasn't mad. I kept my testimony, all of that kind of stuff, all right? I don't want you to think, man, our pastor's going off the handle at the gym or something like that. I didn't do, I didn't do any of that. But here's what I want you to see. I believe that is the way that many people view their membership into God's family. They, they believe that they have access to God, but they don't have the same access as that of pastors or priests, someone who maybe has more of an elite membership. Years ago, we had a lady in our church in Mexico City. Um, she, she came up to me one day and she said, uh, Pastor Brian, would you please pray for me? God listens to you. And I'm like, well, I, I appreciate the fact that you recognize that God listens to me. But, but I told her, he didn't, I said, but God listens to you too. And she said, yeah, but it's just not the same. It's just not the same. You have special access to God. So I had to take my Bible and sit down and say, let's look at a couple of passages of Scripture and let me show you that you have the exact same access that I have. Last week, Jose beautifully taught the fact that every believer has complete, unhindered access to God. And I want you to know today, regardless of how long you have been a follower of Jesus Christ, whether you've been a follower of Jesus Christ for 40 plus years like I have, or whether you've been a follower of Jesus Christ for just a couple of weeks, you have the exact same access to God that I have. You have all of the rights. Here's what I want you to catch. You have full membership as a child of God. In other words, to use biblical terminology, you are God's priest. And as God's priest, you have full access to him. Take your Bibles with me and turn to Exodus chapter 29. We are almost done with our study in Exodus. We have just a few more weeks. We're going to see a few more stories that are taking place in the book of Exodus, but we're almost done. And so uh, you'll remember just by way of review, as we began our study months ago, the children of Israel were in exile. They were in bondage in Egypt. And we have seen how God miraculously liberated them and how God miraculously freed them and, uh, and has taken them out out of bondage, and uh, uh, we went through the whole story of, uh, of redemption and the blood over the doorpost, and we studied the Ten Commandments as God gave his commands to his people, and now in the latter part of Exodus, God is, is sharing with the Israelites the specifications for the tabernacle, for the Holy of Holies, the, the instruments that are to be used in worship, and God is giving some, some, some very specific instructions to the Israelites. And here in Exodus chapter 29, his comments are directed to the priests. 
the, the religious, the spiritual leaders of Israel. So notice Exodus chapter 29, beginning in verse 1. Now this is what you shall do to them. So, 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 uh, so the Lord is speaking to Moses. Now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. Take one bull of the herd and two rams without blemish and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil and unleavened wafers smeared with oil. You shall make them a fine wheat flour. You shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket and bring the bull and the two rams. You shall bring Aaron. Catch all of this. I know it's a little complicated. You shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Then you shall take the garments and put on Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastpiece and gird him with the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And you shall set the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. You shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. Then you shall bring his sons and put coats on them. And you shall gird Aaron and his sons with sashes and bind caps on them. And the priesthood shall be theirs by statute forever. Thus you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. So here's what I want us to catch today. We're going to look at, at the Old Testament consecration of the priests and then we're going to see how that applies to you and me. In other words, here's what I'm asking you not to do. Don't turn me off in the beginning of the message as if we're just studying some tedious Old Testament um, application to the priest. There is application for you and me, and we'll see it today. So notice the first thing, if you have your outline, the first thing we see is this. The Old Testament priests were selected and consecrated for service. The, the ceremony, and there is a ceremony. What we're, what we're reading about here in Exodus chapter 29 is a, is a ceremony. The ceremony that is described in today's passage is actually instituted in Leviticus chapters 8 through 10. If you want more detailed information, go home this afternoon and read Leviticus 8 through 10. Because what is described here is instituted for the very first time there. So here's what's taking place. Having now ordered the manufacture of the tabernacle, the ark, the altar, and all of the utensils that Jose explained last week that are in the ark, Moses now gives instruction as to the priests. And Moses gives instruction as to the priests' consecration and their preparation for ministry. And this consecration, what... Uh, what prepared them for the priesthood was a six-step process that we actually see in the passage. And I want you to see it with me today. First of all, there was a selection. These priests were specifically chosen by God. Now, not everyone in Israel could be a priest. Uh, you would never hear a child who, uh, who was from the tribe of Benjamin or a, a child who was from the tribe of Judah say, I want to be a priest when I grow up. Because everybody didn't have the privilege of being a priest. All of the priests came from one family. All of the priests came from one tribe. As a matter of fact, if you go back just one chapter, to Exodus chapter 28 and verse 1, it's described there. It says, <clears throat> then bring near to you Aaron, your brother. So God is telling Moses, Moses, bring near your brother Aaron and his sons with them from among the people to Israel to serve me as priests, Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. So here's what's taking place. Both Moses and Aaron were from the tribe of Levi. Now, now thank you, Manny. You, you know I was going to need one of those, didn't you? Is it cold? No, it's not cold. Okay. Thank you. I'm just teasing you. Can you find a cold one, Manny? No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> 
both Aaron and Moses were from the tribe of Levi. And the Levites, follow me, the Levites were not the founders of Levi genes. Has nothing to do with that. The, the Levites were the spiritual leaders of the nation of Israel. And so God comes to Aaron and his sons and says, you will be priests. You will be the spiritual leaders for the nation of Israel. So there was a selection process. Secondly, the second part of the process was purification. You remember in verse 4, it says, You shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting, and you shall wash them with water. And so, and so the second part of this ceremony is that the priests were brought to the entrance. And I don't know whether you remember, I don't have a picture. Jose showed us the layout of the temple last week. And, and in the very entrance of the temple, there's a laver there, a laver with water in it. And the priests were brought to the entrance of the temple, to the door of the tabernacle. They were stripped of almost all of their clothes. And they were washed from head to toe. This was an ablution. It was a religious ritual. The, the Targum, an ancient J Jewish document, states that they were possibly placed or immersed in about 70 gallons of water. Whatever the method was, it symbolized their spiritual cleansing. In order to minister on God's behalf to his people, they needed to be purified. They needed to be cleansed. Thirdly, there was preparation. In other words, they were dressed. But verse 5 says, Then you shall take the garments and put on Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastpiece and gird him with the skillfully woven band of the ephod. The high priest was given specific clothing for his office. Each piece had divine representations. I think I put, a, put a, a picture of the garment. And so, <coughs> as we read through, there was a turban that was placed upon the priest's head. Underneath the turban was a gold plate that said, Holy is the Lord. And the reason for that gold plate was to remind the priest every time that he went into God's presence, he was going into the holy presence of God. He then had, uh, 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 you can see, he had like a, a white robe with a blue robe over top of it. And then there was a, there was a sash that went over that. There were two, two onyx stones that were on his shoulders that had the names of the 12 tribes of Israel representing the fact that he bore the weight, the spiritual weight of the Israelites. He had a breast piece, and there were 12 different stones on the breast piece, each representing one of the 12 tribes of Israel. He had bells at the bottom. The bells at the bottom were for the priest's protection as he entered into the presence of God. You can see that, and you can study it later on. It's really cool. Every single facet of that outfit has a spiritual significance. And I would submit to you today that every single aspect of that outfit not only has a spiritual significance, but it points to Jesus Christ. That's a study for a different day. The priests were prepared. The third part, the third step, or, 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 or the fourth step in the process was consecration. But verse 7 says, you shall take the anointing oil and pour it on the priest's head and anoint him. It, it wasn't just a little bit of oil that was kind of put just on his forehead. No, 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 they were... They took a flask filled with oil, and they poured the oil on Aaron's head. Psalm 133 describes that. If you remember Psalm 133, that great psalm that talks about unity, it says, it is like the precious oil on the head running down the beard of Aaron. And so, I mean, this, the, the, there wasn't just a little bit of oil that was used. He was anointed with a lot of oil. Anointing throughout Scripture symbolized the empowering and the equipping for service. Throughout Scripture, oil is used as a picture or as a representation 
of Jesus, or, or of the Holy Spirit, excuse me. So, so the, the fifth part of the process was sanctification. It's actually the largest part of this chapter, and we're not taking the time to read it, but in verses 10 through 28, it talks about the sanctification process, how the priest was sanctified. And there were actually three separate sacrifices that were made for the priest. I'll let you read it. Let me just outline it for you, and you can study it later on. There, first of all, was a bull offering. So, so, so this bull was, was, was killed and sacrificed. This was the sin offering. The priest actually put his head, or excuse me, his hands on the head of the bull, thus demonstrating his personal guilt and his desire for the blood of the bull to count against his own sin. In other words, the bull, the the priest is sitting back realizing that my sins need to be atoned for. My sins need to be covered. And that first offering was for the sins of the priest himself. There was then a ram offering, verses 15 through 18. This was a demonstration of the priest's dedication of himself to God for service. And then there was a peace Offering A second ram was offered. This was a unique sacrifice in which the blood of the ram was not only sprinkled on the, uh, not only sprinkled on the altar there on the mercy seat, but it also it was placed on the extremities of the priest's body. Verse 20, you can look in the chapter, says that, that some of the blood from that bull was placed on the tip of the right ear of the priest, on the thumbs of his right hands, and on the big toe of his right foot. Now you might sit back and say, boy, that sounds weird. Why would they put blood on his ear, on his thumb, and on the big toe of his right foot? In other words, the idea was showing that all of his body from one end to the other was covered by the blood. The atonement applied to his entire body, to his entire nature. He then would be given a part of the ram, and he would wave this piece of meat up and down and wave. It was called a wave offering. And he would wave the meat up and down as a wave offering to the Lord. This was the sanctificational process for the priest. And then the sixth part, you're going to like this. The sixth part was inauguration. In verses 31 through 34, they were fed. Doesn't that sound like just a great Baptist get-together? And so, and so they, had this, they had this washing, then they had these sacrifices, and at the end they said, okay, let's sit down and eat. It ended, as it were, with a barbecue, not for the entire um, group of Israelites, but just for the priests. The eating came after the washing. It came after the clothing. It came after the blood, the atonement of the priests. And the eating spoke of the priest's continual relationship with the Lord. Now, let me encourage you. Um, I, I, I raced through an entire chapter really quick right there. Let me encourage you at some point to spend some time reading and studying these chapters. You will find that these chapters are literally filled with spiritual truth, okay? But I want you to get that as the foundation. So the foundation of Exodus chapter 29 is this, that the Old Testament priests were selected by God and they were consecrated for service. Are you with me on that? All right. So here's where we're at. Here's where the application takes us today. Like the Old Testament priests, you and I, you and I have been chosen and consecrated by God. Like the Old Testament priests, you and I have been chosen and consecrated by God. At the beginning of the message, we made this statement, you are God's priest. As a matter of fact, look at the person beside you and say, I'm a priest. <laughs> All right, that, that might sound funny. You might sit back and say, Brian, where's my collar? Where's my robe? Where's my turban? You are a 
priest. And, and we're going to see that in the New Testament today because the passage that Brad read just a few moments ago ties in with what we're studying here in Exodus chapter 29. As a matter of fact, Protestant churches have a creed or a belief that we hold very strongly. It's called the priesthood of the believer. And the priesthood of the believer basically says this, that every individual has direct access to God without ecclesiastical mediation, and each individual shares the responsibility of ministering to the other members of the community. So, 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 so here's what that means. Get this. You don't have to confess your sins to me. You don't have to come to Brian, who is a priest or a pastor, and say, okay, Pastor Brian, i got to tell you all the bad things I did this week. Now, now sometimes we do that, and sometimes people want to get it off of their chest, but, but, but you don't need to do that. You say, Brian, how can I confess my sins? You, as a priest, can go directly to God. The priesthood of the believer, you have the privilege yourself of entering into God's presence. So here's what I put in your notes. I put the statement, every believer is a priest and has direct access to God. As a matter of fact, that six-fold process that we saw in Exodus chapter 29 can be applied to you and I as well. The same steps that they went through are steps that you and I go through as God's priest. Let me give you a, um, an idea very quickly, okay? First of all, you, like the Old Testament priests, were chosen by God. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Catch this today. You, as a believer, were chosen by God. Sometimes we get that back up, back, uh, backwards. We think, okay, well, we're the ones that selected God. I finally came to the place in my life where I said, okay, I'm tired of my past and I'm going to choose God. You didn't choose God. God chose you, and he chose you, Paul tells us, before the very foundation of the world. You didn't decide to love him. John tells us he loved us before we ever loved him. And so as a New Testament priest, you have been chosen by God. <laughs> Here's the second truth. You have been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You have been washed by the blood of Christ. Jose uh, spoke last week out of Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? As we've illustrated the last few weeks, the reason that we don't have an altar here, I mean, I, I guess you could call this an altar, but the reason we don't have a, uh, an altar here where we put blood sacrifices on is because Jesus made the ultimate perfect sacrifice once and forever for your sins and mine. And as a follower of Christ, you have been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. John tells us in 1 John chapter 1, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us, purifies us from all sin. And so, like the Old Testament priest, you were chosen. Like the Old Testament priest, you have been purified. Like those Old Testament priests, you have been clothed. You say, what are you talking about? I don't have a uniform. No, this isn't, we're not talking about physical clothes. We're talking about spiritual clothes. Uh, Romans chapter 13 and 14, Paul says, but put on 
the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Ephesians 6, 14, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So just as you got dressed this morning before you came to church and and you selected clothes and you put on those clothes, as a follower of Jesus Christ, you are dressed with the righteousness of Christ. I was reminded when I was a a teenager, we sang choruses in our our youth group, obviously different than the choruses they sing today, but we used to sing this chorus. Some of you might remember this. Oh, the best thing in my life I ever did do. Oh, the best thing in my life I ever did do. Oh, the best thing in my life I ever did do was take off the old robe and put on the new. Now the old robe was dirty, all tattered and torn, and the new robe was spotless and never been worn. What's the idea? Today, I am dressed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And even though I am not perfect, and neither are you, when God looks at you, he sees the clothing of his son. And you are dressed, you are clothed in righteousness. You are anointed by the Holy Spirit of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us, his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Here's what I want you to see. As a priest, you have been selected and chosen by God, washed, purified, dressed, anointed, and prepared for service. If you're following in your outlines, the next thing I wrote is this. As a, as a, priest, as a priest, every believer has a responsibility to fulfill. Uh, As you read through uh, Exodus chapter 29 and then specifically Leviticus chapter 8, 9, and 10, those those Old Testament priests had specific responsibilities. Matter of fact, they were given detailed responsibilities, how they were supposed to offer the sacrifices, how they were supposed to enter into the temple, how they were supposed to cleanse themselves ahead of time, what they were supposed to do for the people. They had specific responsibilities. Where as a priest, every believer has a responsibility to fulfill. Brad read, I don't want to read all of it again, but Brad read for us 1 Peter chapter 2, in which Peter lays out our priestly responsibilities. He lays out our priestly privileges, but he also lays out our priestly responsibilities. Let me read those verses again, and now that you understand the context, would you allow that to sink into your mind and into your heart? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. And, and you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a, notice the word, a holy what? Priesthood. To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. So God is working in your life and in mine, creating us to be a holy priesthood, offering sacrifices, not the sacrifices of blood and goats, but now spiritual sacrifices. Those are our responsibilities. Jump down to verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. I think it's so cool as I look out across our auditorium, I see people from all kinds of different ethnicities and and some of you were born in different countries and you come from different backgrounds and, and we all come from a variety of different nations and cultures and countries, but God brings us together and what are we? We are one holy nation in him. 
As a matter of fact, we are closer to our spiritual brothers and sisters than we are our biological brothers and sisters. Because those are relationships that are going to last for all of eternity. And I hope with your biological siblings it is as well. But the relationship with that, that, that you have with those sitting beside you is so much deeper. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you had received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Three responsibilities. Let me mention it. I'm done. Three responsibilities, three commitments that we have as priests. The first is this. You and I have a community commitment. He talks about it here. We're one nation. We are a, we are a chosen people. We are family that God has brought together. Brad yesterday taught our life group leaders and did a great job and reminded us of the fact that you and I were created for community. We were not created to be alone. As a matter of fact, as far back as Genesis chapter 2, God says, it is not good that man should be alone. We were created for community. As a kingdom of priests, we are connected with one another. Community is extremely important. So what does that mean? It means that you and I have the responsibility to minister to one another. The people that you're sitting beside this morning aren't just the people that you sit beside on Sunday morning. They're your brothers and sisters in Christ. And you have a responsibility to pray for them, to love them, to be patient with them through the good times and through the bad. Why is that? Because as priests, we have a community responsibility. That, that, that's tough in the culture in which we live. People, people, and, and I'm, I'm preaching to the choir today, but people are less and less connected to a body of believers today than they used to be. The average, the average church member attends church 35 times a year. That's average. Used to be, a good grief, when Pastor Ackerman was, was here, they used to say three to thrive. You got to be here Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. If you're not here three times during the week, then you're not growing in your relationship with the Lord. And we can't even get people back every Sunday. We've lost that sense of community. We've lost that need for one another. Peter says there is a community commitment. Let me show you secondly, there's an evangelistic commitment. He says, he said that you have been uh, selected, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The word proclaim means to speak forth, to verbalize. The word excellence means, excellencies means God's gracious dealings, his glorious dealings with you. Here's a great verse, and, and, and I'll apply it to you specifically the psalmist says in Psalm 40, he brought me up out of the pit of destruction. He brought me up out of the miry clay. He set my feet on a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, the song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and trust in the Lord. You see, as a priest, you have a responsibility to proclaim. You say, Brian, what in the world do I proclaim? You simply proclaim what God's done in your life. You simply share with others what God is doing in your life. It's not rocket science. How is he changing you? What is he doing in your life? I love the story in the New Testament of the blind man who was healed, and the Pharisees were trying to dig in. Well, how did he heal you? What did he say? All of this. And the man's response was classic. He said, I don't know all of that stuff. Here's what I do know. I was blind, but now I see. Listen, what has God done? in your life. That, that's what you, as a priest, have a responsibility to proclaim and share with others. 
And then lastly, there is a personal commitment. In verse 11, Paul say, or, or Peter says, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. The word abstain means to hold back, to keep away from. And here's what he challenges us to abstain from, from fleshly lusts. Those, those, those desires, sinful desires that war against your very soul. Abstain from those things. From bad behavior, keep your behavior excellent. Why is that? So that others may see your good works and glorify God. Here's what I want you to catch. We can, we can take Exodus chapter 29 and say, Oh my word, these boring regulations that were given for priests in the Old Testament, they don't apply to us. They do apply to us because you are the New Testament equivalent of the Old Testament priests. The Old Testament priesthood was exclusive. The New Testament priesthood is inclusive. You don't have to be a Levite to be a priest. You can be a guy from Canton, Ohio, and be a priest, all right? As a priest, do you realize your privileges and your profession, your responsibility? Are you fulfilling your role as God's appointed priest? Would you pray with me today? Lord, thank you so much for the truth of your word. And Lord, I pray today that you would take your word and drive it home to our hearts and our minds. Father, we, we desperately need you. We cannot live without you. We certainly can't do the things that you ask us to do on our own. We need the anointing, the equipping, the empowering of the Holy Spirit of God. And thank you, Lord, that you've not only told us what you desire for us, but you've given us everything that we need to fulfill it. So, God, I pray that you'd help us to live our lives this week as your priests, your representatives, representing you before the people. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.